before we write any code together, let's just define what we mean by an array. Okay. As I mentioned, arrays are kind of unique in Java, and I think their syntax is kind of unique. Um, I don't know the history of the development of the Java programming language very well, but the, my impression is they took arrays, which was an idea from like the C programming language, and they just threw it right into Java syntax and all. So it doesn't really look like anything else in Java, um, but we'll figure it out. It's not that bad. Um, an array is an ordered list of values, okay? What I mean by that is there are multiple values all stored in the same array, okay? Think of it as like a, a bin with a whole bunch of subdividers and we can put different values in each little subdivided section of the bin. Um, and it's ordered, meaning that one value is first and a different value is last, and then there's all the values in between. Um, it is kind of like an object. Arrays are kind of like objects in Java, but they're not. And so I'm gonna use the word like a lot today to make comparisons but they're not really the same things. Um, they, we do reference them by variables. Um, each element in the array does have an index, like each character in a string has an index, okay? So again, just to be clear, strings are not arrays of characters. Strings are their own class. That said, I'll also be comparing a lot of stuff to strings today because there's a lot of similarities between characters in a string and elements in an array. So these comparisons help us even though they're not exactly the same thing. For example, when we index different elements in the array, it does start at zero, just like the index of the first character in the string is zero. Um, so that's another similarity there as well. So let's write a little bit of code together. So I opened up, so where's our project? Here's our project. There's a lot of stuff here. Um, we're gonna focus for most of the unit right here on these files. Um, all of this stuff to the right is one cool practice programming activity we're gonna do for a game later in the unit. All of this stuff at the bottom is for our big summative lab and, and final lab at the end of the unit. Um, so we're gonna focus up here for now. So let's go ahead and open up array notes. And we're just gonna write a couple of static methods today to help us uh, really focus on the syntax of arrays. So let's start by creating a static method, public static void create array of evens. We're doing this as a static method just to save time so we don't have to create a new object just to call methods on it. We just want something easy to, to code here. Um, so what's the syntax to declare a variable that's an array? So this method eventually is gonna create an array of even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, all the way up to 20. Here's the syntax to create the variable. We, each element in the array has to be of the same type. So we can have an array of int values, we can have an array of Boolean values, we can have an array of turtles, we can have an array of buildings. In fact, as we go through this unit, I think you're gonna be like, oh, this would have been really helpful for the cityscape lab. Um, so we're gonna have an array of int values. So we're gonna say int, and then we're gonna follow it with a left and a right square bracket. The square brackets are like the same key as the curly brackets, but you don't hold down the shift key. And I'm gonna call this evens. When I read the code like this, in my head, what I see is I, I read int, and then when I see the square brackets, I replace that with array. So I'm like, oh, I've got an int array called evens, cool. And then I can assign it um, to a new array. Like we have, like with class, like with objects, we actually have to create a new object from the class. Arrays are similar. We actually use the new keyword even though they're not really classes. Um, so we say new int square bracket, and then inside the square brackets, we specify how many elements are gonna be in our array. So here I have an int array variable called evens. I'm assigning it a, a reference to a new integer array 
of 10 elements. That's how I like read that line of code in my head. So these square brackets are new. We only use square brackets in Java programming language for arrays. We're not gonna use them for anything else, okay? It's very special purpose syntax. Um, so let's capture some details about this. There's a lot of stuff in this one line of code. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, an array is an ordered collection of elements of the same type. That's important. Um, again, ordered means that one element is first, another element is last. There are other types of collections in Java where the um, elements are not ordered. Think of it as just like a bag with a bunch of stuff inside that's all jumbled up. There's no order to the elements. An array is ordered. That's important. It's also important that the elements have to be of the same type. So we can have an array of ints, an array of booleans, an array of turtles, array of strings, but we can't have an array that has elements that are both ints and the other elements that are turtles. That is not permitted. Every element has to be of the same type. The type can be a primitive type, primitive type, like an int, or a class type, like a turtle or a string. Oops. We just can't mix them. An array variable is like an object variable. Again, I'm using the word like here. It's not really an object variable, but it's like an object variable in that it must be declared and initialized. All right, so we're still using the, the new keyword here. That's at least the same. All right, other key aspects of the syntax here. The number in the square brackets, and again, square brackets are, are these things, specifies the number of elements in the array. Here's an important limitation of arrays. The number of elements in the array cannot be changed. So once we create this array of 10 elements, this array will always have 10 elements. We can't remove, we can't delete an element from an array such that it only has nine elements. We can't add an extra element to the end of the array and make it have 11 elements. Arrays don't work that way. Um, it's not possible. If we truly want to add another element to the array and have 11 elements, we actually have to make a whole new array with 11 elements and then copy each and every element from the old array to the new array. Okay. If this seems overly restrictive, um, it works out okay. Next semester, we'll see there's other ways, other data structures we can use when we do want this type of a feature. Um, but we tend to use arrays in situations where the number of elements doesn't change. Okay, it, it ends up working out just fine. Um, another important part is when we do create this new array of 10 integer values, all elements in the array are initialized to their default values. And, and a reminder, what I mean by default values is like zero for integers and doubles, false for Booleans, nulls for all class types. So at this point, we'll have 10 elements and the value of every element will be zero. If we had an array of turtles, we'd have 10 turtles and the value of every element would be null because we don't actually haven't created any turtles yet. So just to be clear, this code creates an array that contains 10 int elements. There we go, not too bad.
as we type code together today, I'm also gonna show you lots of pictures of arrays to try to build up that conceptual model because I think arrays can be a little challenged conceptually. Um, so I took screenshots from the Java visualizer. So for example, here's what the line of code we wrote does so far. Um, think of this little blue section here as like a post-it note back to our conceptual model. So here's a post-it note with the label evens. The value on the post-it note is a reference denoted by this arrow to some chunk of computer's memory that has room to store 10 integer values, okay? Like a reference to a sheet of paper that has room for 10 integer values. Or back to our physical model, evens here is like the pocket labeled evens. And what's in that pocket is a Wii remote referring to this chunk of computer memory where there's room to have 10 integer values. If it's helpful, think that like, hey, we can't possibly fit 10 integer values onto that post-it note or a hundred or a thousand or a million integer values onto the post-it note. So yeah, we got to use a reference to some big chunk of computer's memory to store all these elements. So this is the picture that we have so far. All right, let's initialize this array, not initial, let's set the value of each element in this array to even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, up to 20. So here's the syntax for that. We're gonna be writing lots of for loops. So we're gonna say for int i equals zero, i is less than evens dot length. So here's some new syntax. The way we determine how many elements are in the array is by using the variable name evens, the dot, and then the keyword length. Length is not a method. There are no parentheses after length. In fact, there are no methods on arrays because they're not actually objects. Um, but it's like length is a public instance variable. Right, so it's kind of like we're accessing a public instance variable here. So we have evens dot length. Um, dot length is the only thing that is the only dot anything that goes with an array. There's no other special like words that fit there. We could have just said i is less than ten, but it's better practice to use evens dot length once we've initialized our array. Because that way, if we go back and change our code to be like, oh, actually we want 20 elements, we don't have to change the number 10 throughout the rest of our code, right? We just change it in one place. So here's how we do the initialization. We do the variable name evens. We do square brackets again, but inside the square bracket, we specify the index of the element that we're gonna assign a value to. And we'll assign a value of, let's see, i plus one times two, will get us the numbers two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, so on and so forth. So there's a little bit of new syntax here. What this little for loop does is it will set the value of each element in the array to the first 10 positive, positive, even, integers. Length is used to query the number of elements in the array. That's important. That's new. And square brackets are used to reference a specific element in the array based on its index. Indices are zero based. So this is good. Just like indices in a string are zero based, the first characters that index zero, indices in arrays are zero based, the first element in the array is at index zero as well. Really by saying even square bracket with an index and another square bracket, this whole highlighted part, think of it as treat it just like you treat a normal like integer variable. We can assign a value to it. We can get a value from it. Anywhere we could use a normal integer value, we can use evens square bracket with an index inside. They're the same type of thing. C 
So sometimes we can calculate, like we're doing here, what we want the value of all the elements of the array to do, in which case a for loop works great. Sometimes we might be reading it from a file. Sometimes we might be querying the user with like scanner and building up the elements in the array. All of those are, are common, common usages. So back to our picture, at this point, our array looks like this. Here's evens. The value of the variable evens is this reference to this chunk of the computer's memory, where now we have the values 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. The index of the, of the element with the value of 2 is 0. The index of the element with the value of 20 is 9. And the length of this array is 10. It's the number of elements in the array. Just like the length of a string is the number of characters in the string. So another similarity there as well. Let's print an array. Print the array. System. Oops. System.out.println evens. So compile and run that. I'm going to do the same. This is what prints. Okay. This might look familiar when we were printing objects like a couple of units ago. Um, this is just the reference. Your reference might be probably is different than my reference, right? This is just the reference to the array, um, which is not that useful. So this actually prints the reference to the array. If we want to actually print all of the values of all the elements, we need to write a for loop to do that. So let's do that. For in i equals zero, i is less than evens dot length, i plus plus. And then I'm going to print the index concatenated with a colon and a space, concatenated with the value of the element. Just so it'll be like zero colon two. So it's like the index in one column, the value in another column. Notice it's the same syntax here to get the value of an element in the array as it is to set the value of an element in the array. It's just evens square bracket i. And one more thing related to the sequence. I don't know where this comes from, but I will often refer to this as evens sub i, like sub sub i. Um, it's not really a subscript. I don't know why people say that, but like that's definitely common. So referring to the thing in the square brackets as like even sub i is something you'll hear as well. I should look up where that came from. Anyway, if we run this, now we'll actually see everything printed. Index 0 has a value of 2, index 1 has a value of 4, so on and so forth, up to index 9 having a value of 20. So that's the syntax to declare a variable that's an array type, to create a new array, to set the value of elements in the array, to get the length of the array, and to get the value of elements in the array. Sometimes, however, we know up front what we want all the values of all the elements in the array to be. And so there's more efficient ways of initializing, of both creating a new array and initializing all the elements all at once. So let's write another method that does that. So we're going to create another public static void method called create array of odds. And we're going to use a different type of syntax here. We're still going to have an integer array 
with a variable name of odds. And we're still going to assign it the reference return by saying new integer array. But we're not going to put the number of elements in here. Instead, we're going to follow this with a curly bracket. And then the values of all the elements separated by commas. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Another curly bracket and a semicolon. This is kind of a nightmare of Java syntax. Um, but it's unique to arrays. What this is called is an array literal. So a reminder about literals. And the, an int literal is like the number seven. This right here is an int literal. Um, a Boolean literal is like true or false. Um, a string literal, like string is special in that it's a class that actually is the only class that has a literal, is double quotes and like all the characters, right? Um, this is the syntax for an array literal. So an array literal, which is the curly brackets and comma separated values. An array literal can be used to initialize the array. This is most commonly used when we know what, when we're writing the code, what we want all the values to be. And often we do. And so this is a good way to do that. You can see how this could be useful perhaps to create an array of uh, trees for your cityscape or something. The size of the array is inferred based on the number of elements in the literal. So that's why we didn't bother putting the 10 inside of here because Java knows there are 10 elements because we listed out 10 elements. We don't need to specify that information twice. This one line of code does exactly the same thing as like these lines of code here if we change this to be odd numbers instead. Okay? The end result is the same. This is just more convenient if we know what we want the values to be. It's one of the advantages of using an array. Let's print out all of these elements as well. So let's do another for loop. For int i equals zero. i is less than or equal to odds dot length. i plus plus. System dot out dot println. Again, I'll print the index. Concatenated with a colon and the space. And then I'll access the value of the element at index i. So let's go ahead and compile and run that. So I'm going to run create array of odds. And when I do, my program crashes. And at the bottom here, I get java.lang.array index out of bounds exception. So this is an exception, runtime exception. So I have some sort of a runtime error. Index 10 out of bounds for length 10. I love the descriptive method. It tells me what the value of my index was. It was 10. It tells me the length of the array, which is also 10. So valid indices are from 0 to 9. That's why I get an array index out of bounds exception. You're going to run into this all the time. So I just wanted you to see it first here so you're not surprised when you see it later. Usually it's due to our infamous off by one error, right? I wrote my for loop incorrectly here. I needs to start at zero, and we want the loop to continue to run as long as I is less than odds.length, not less than or equal to. So I'm going to actually leave it broken like this and write a comment because I think this is important. 
because it's going to show up a lot. This is the array index out of bounds exception. Really long name. So arrays have a fixed size once initialized. The index specified must refer to a valid index. Otherwise, an array index out of bounds ex uh, exception is generated. So to be clear, if we specify an invalid index, it's not like it returns zero or null or something. It throws an exception. We cannot do that. So we have to make sure to write code that never specifies an invalid index for an array. It's simply not, not permitted. So I'm gonna comment out the print statement so that we can still see the example here so we can refer back to it later as needed. So that's like our pitfall for today. So watch out for the array index out of bounds exception. All right, here's three lines of code. So I will, we're gonna type these, you're gonna compile it and run it. But before you compile it and run it, I want you to predict what's gonna be printed. So we're gonna declare another variable, which is an int array named more odds. We're gonna assign it the value of the variable odds. I'm then gonna use the variable odds to reference the array at index two and set that element to six. And then I'm gonna print the value of the element at index two in the array referenced by the variable more odds. And I want you to predict what will be printed. And once you've made your prediction, compile and run the code and see if you're correct. All right, I'm gonna compile it and run it too. It prints six. Okay. You may have thought it would print five, but let's look at what this actually looks like in terms of our conceptual model. When we said more odds equals odds, we take the value of odds, which is this reference, and we copy the reference onto the post-it note for more odds. We now have two variables both referencing the same chunk of memory. There's still only one array. We didn't make another array. We're back to the same concept that we had with like turtles in the very first unit and rectangles and stuff like that, right? We simply copied the reference. We did not copy the array itself. So it doesn't matter which variable we use, but if we change the value at, element, at index two to a six, this five will be replaced by a six. And if we then get the value at index two, it doesn't matter which variable we use because they refer to the same array, they're both gonna return six. If we truly wanted to copy the array, we would have to make a new array and then write a loop that copies each and every element from the old array to the new array, which we totally could do, but we just have to write the code to, to do that. So let's make sure we capture, this is really important. And we're going to build on this throughout this whole, this whole unit. This is all about array references. So variables of type array contain a reference to the array stored in the computer's memory. In the same way that variables of class types contain a reference to the object stored in the computer's memory. And much in the same way as we saw with turtles and rectangles, assigning one array variables value to another copies the reference, not the array's elements.
just to review a little bit, we focused yesterday on the syntax for how do we declare an array variable like that, how we create a new empty array or a new array of elements where each element is initialized to their default value. That'd be more precise. Um, we saw how to index an array to set values. We saw how to index an array to get values of each element. Um, we then saw how we can initialize an array with an array literal. So that was new. Um, we saw how if we're off by one, we'll get an array index out of bounds exception. We went back and revisited the idea of references from the very beginning of this unit, this challenging concept that we keep revisiting, realizing that what is actually stored in the variable is a reference to the array, not the array itself. Therefore, multiple variables can refer to the same array. And if we use one variable to change the array, it's reflected when we access via the other variable. So this actually prints six, is what we found out yesterday. There's one more cool thing I wanna show you about arrays today before we do some of the pure instruction questions. Um, and that is there's a different type of for loop we can use with arrays. Um, and last unit when we did for loops, if you're familiar with Python for loops, you were probably thinking these for loops are nothing like Python for loops. And you're right, they're not. But these new for loops that we're gonna see today are like Python for loops. So they should be a little bit more familiar in terms of how they work. So let's add a little comment block here, oops, about this. These for loops are called, let me put my code in the right place. They're called enhanced for loops. And what an enhanced for loop does is it iterates over the elements in an array. This is a more gen general concept. We'll see this show up again next semester. Um, in software engineering, we study how exactly this works because it's something that's true of, of most collections or I guess all collections, not just arrays. Um, it is similar to make this connection to Python. It is similar to the for value in structure in Python. So that should be helpful. Here's what the syntax looks like. Still starts out with four. We still have parentheses. We still have a loop variable. I'm gonna call it odd. And then we have a colon in the name of the array variable. When I read this, I read this as four odd in odds. I think it's really helpful for readability if your array variables are in the plural form because there are multiple elements. And if your loop variable for the enhanced for loop is in the singular form, um, it just makes it read well. I think it makes it more understandable. Um, so we could do something as simple as just use this to print out all the elements in the array. Now, what I do wanna be clear about here, a source of confusion once, now that we have like two types of for loops, the value of this loop variable odd is not an index. It is the value of the elements in the array. So this is gonna have values of one, three, five, seven. Um, if we had an array of turtles, this variable would be set to refer to each turtle in the array. Or if we had an array of strings, this loop variable would refer to, it would be of type string and it would refer to each string in the array. It's no longer an index. So you just have to be careful to realize like these are no longer indices, unlike the for loops we were writing yesterday, where we were using the loop variable i to index into the array. So just an important clarification there. So if we compile and run this, Sure enough, it prints one, three, six, seven, nine, so on and so forth. This is really convenient. And I definitely encourage you to use it whenever possible because it's just, there's less opportunities for mistakes. Um, 
And, and one tip is I definitely recommend when appropriate using this like on AP free response questions because it's so easy when you when you can't run your code to be off by one like we were up here and have an array index out of bounds exception and lose one or two points on your free response question as a result. Whereas with the enhanced for loop, it's impossible to have an array index out of bounds exception because the enhanced for loop does all the indexing for you. You don't need to worry about the bounds. You can't get it wrong, right? So it's it definitely use this when appropriate. Unfortunately, there are some limitations of this um, and we can't always use it. So let's explore that. Um, let's write another enhanced for loop for in odds in odds again. This time in the for loop, let's increment the variable odd by one. And then let's print out the array a second time. I just copy and pasted that for efficiency. So we're printing out all the elements in the array odds. We're running this loop and incrementing the variable odd by one. Then we're running the same loop again to print all the variable in the array odds. So type this pause and predict what will this loop print and then compile and run your code to verify your prediction. I'm gonna run it as well. Here is printing the array the first time. Here is printing the array the second time. Nothing has changed. That may not be what you expected. However, if we think back to our conceptual model with the post-it notes, I hope that this can, can make sense. This local variable odd here, it's its own post-it note. There's a post-it note labeled odd. And the way the enhanced for loop works is each time the for loop iterates, it takes the next element in the array odds and it copies the value of the element from the array to the post-it note. So the first time this runs, it copies the value one from this array, copies this value one, stores it in the variable odd on its own post-it note. We say odd plus equals one, the value on that post-it note most definitely changes to two, but that has no connection with the value stored in this array because we copied the value out of the array onto the post-it note, right? So it doesn't make any change. So this is, this is why we can't always use the enhanced for loop. There are a couple limitations of enhanced for loops. And the first is that the local variable, in this case odd, contains a copy of the value of the element in the array. Because it's a copy, that means we cannot change the value of the elements, oops, in the array. So if we want to actually change the value of elements in the array, we cannot use an enhanced for loop. We gotta go back and use the traditional for loop, okay? The only way to change the value of an element in the array is to index into the array just like we did here. Right, we can't do it with the enhanced for loop. The other limitation is we cannot easily determine the index of an element. So if that's important, if we need to know the index of the element, we should just use our traditional for loop um, because we have no access to the current index here with the enhanced for loop. Okay? If we don't need to change a value, 
And if we don't need the index, please use the enhanced for loop. It's going to save lots of trouble, reduce bugs so much easier. Um, but if either of these two conditions apply, we got to do it the hard way. We got to use the traditional for loop.